Welcome back to the episode of Bucket Playground. Today, I'm going to be making two bromopropane, also known as isopropyl bromide. Now, isopropyl bromide makes for a great synth on in constructing bigger molecules because of the bromide items' easy detachability. However, this same detachability also makes it highly carcinogenic. It can affect DNA and proteins and other tissues, so you definitely don't want to touch this. Now that we got the warnings out of the way, let's begin. The materials you need are isopropyl alcohol, sodium bromide, sulfuric acid, and calcium chloride. Before I do anything, I must determine whether my sodium bromide is anhydrous or the dihydrate. To do this, I weigh a small vial, 8.2 grams. Then I weigh it with some sodium bromide. The net weight is right at 4.0 grams. Next, I heat up the sample with an intense flame for a bit. After wiping off the soot, I weigh it again. If there was water, it would have lost a gram or so. However, as you can see, the weight remains unchanged. Thus, I have anhydrous sodium bromide. A bit of relief too, if you ask me. Can you imagine how much more I would have to use if it was the dihydrate? To start, I weighed out a little over 340 grams of sodium bromide. This is approximately 3.3 moles of sodium bromide. With the bromide salt, I pour it into a blender cup. And then I go to town. The trick is brief but frequent blendings rather than one long blending. This is so I don't overheat the motor and the powder. I want to grind it down into an almost floury or cornstarchy like consistency. This will increase the reaction surface area which will in turn increase the conversion. After, I reweigh just to see if there's any product loss. Luckily it was only 3 grams. I will put this in a deep freezer for a quick chill while I do the next part. Next, I pour out 500 milliliters or 6.05 moles of freezing 91% isopropyl alcohol. You could use 99%, but note that the extra water does help buffer sulfuric gases oxidizing effects. I pour this into a pre-chilled 1 liter boiling flask to further keep it cool. Remember, the colder you start, the less likely bromide will oxidize into bromine. Once I get it stirring, I start to add in my sodium bromide. It is important to have the stir rate high so the sodium bromide does not settle, which will seize the whole mixture and significantly decrease the rate of reaction. Then I pour in 220 milliliters of freezing 85% sulfuric gas into an addition funnel. The reason why I'm using 85% as opposed to 98% is that 98% would be too oxidizing and this is the concentration I got from simply adding 12% hydrogen peroxide to sulfuric acid drain cleaner. Distilling sulfuric gas would be pointless since this is a displacement reaction. It is important to find the right drip rate. Too fast and more bromide will be oxidized instead of acidified. Too slow and your reaction vessel will reach room temperature long before all the sulfuric acid is added. I try to get it just so the rate of infusion happens over the course of 20 to 25 minutes. One thing to note is that freezing sulfuric acid is quite viscous which can also influence the rate of infusion. The rate can speed up and slow down without even me turning the stop cop. Still, I try to find the best sorter rate that takes into account those strange variables. Once it is all infused, I keep the stir rate high for a few hours or until the mixture naturally seizes. I want all the sodium bromide and acid to be thoroughly mixed before I begin heating. One thing to note though is that there might still be some caking, but that's okay. When I check the temperature, I find it is at least 42 C. Before, the mixture was around minus 8 C since the reactants were stored in the same freezer my liquid isobutylene is in. That's why it is super duper important to start everything as cold as possible. The next day, the mixture is naturally seized and separated. Luckily, it is still very fluid and can be remixed for a short time before it separates again. To understand what is happening, we need to view it on a molecular level. In the first step, the alcohol is protonated by an acid to form an oxonium ion. This makes for a perfect leaving group in the form of water. With the alkyl group now a cation, the bromide ion makes its move by using its excess electrons to bond with the site. That is how isopropyl bromide is formed. Eventually, I get approximately 500 milliliters of distillate. I pour this back into my 1 liter round bottom flask. While stirring, I add another 340 grams of powdered sodium bromide. Ideally, this should react with the other half of isopropanol that is left. Finally, I top it off with another 220 milliliters of sulfuric acid. I found the perfect drip on the first go, so I'm just going to leave it like this for around 20 minutes. As the reaction progresses, it starts to become yellow as a little bit of the bromide salt is oxidized into bromine. Near the end though, it takes on this rich grapefruit juice color. 
The salt caking is not as bad either, which is very good. Once the infusion is done, I take off the addition funnel and quickly cap it so my isopropyl bromide nor the hydrogen bromide can escape. I'll leave it stirring like this until tomorrow or when it ceases. The next day, the solution has become dark red, yet still very mobile. So, I'm just going to proceed to distill it rather than wait for it to seize. In the beginning, bubbles are just bursting out of the crude, murky layer. Pretty soon, however, it seems to almost lighten as my crude product comes racing in. From what it looks like, there may have been some intense frothing that eventually exploded, leaving salts all throughout my distillation system. Some oil also seems to have shot up and over its land into my distillate. Luckily, it doesn't seem missable. To purify my isopropyl bromide, I first poured it into an addition funnel. While the oil doesn't come through, some of the colorants did. Next, I add 200 milliliters of saturated sodium bicarbonate solution. I give it a good shake to neutralize any of the remaining hydrogen bromide and suck out a lot of the water. One cool thing this also does is decolorize my crude isopropyl bromide. After the two layers separate, I drain off more organic layer on the bottom. Next, I drain off again after washing with 100 milliliters of cold water. I'm hoping that pulled out at least some of the isopropyl alcohol. Then I add some calcium chloride to remove the rest of the water. One thing I found interesting on the internet was that calcium chloride can supposedly bind to simple alcohols like methanol and ethanol. I found no mention of isopropanol though, but it doesn't hurt to try. Soon, the solution does clear up. This means all the water has been removed from the solution. However, that does not necessarily mean all my isopropanol is. When I took the density of this, it was just under 1.27 grams per milliliter. Isopropyl bromide is 1.31 grams per milliliter, so I still got a little more work to do. In a 1 liter boiling flask, I put down around 20 milliliters of calcium chloride and add in my crude product. Then, I softly distill it. Now, a couple things I want you to notice about this setup. I'm using a 1 liter Erlenmeyer flask because it is tall enough to really capture and hold that volatile isopropyl bromide fumes while also throwing off the distillation setup a bit. What do I mean by this? As you can see, the still head leans away from the condenser rather than leaning toward it, which is traditional. Since I don't have another condenser for a proper fractional distillation, this extra barrier helps further separate the two isopropyl analogs. Finally, I found that having the hot plate setting at a little past 3 allowed the distillation to slowly but steadily proceed. A little further and more isopropanol would also come over. A little less and the distillation would cease entirely. The downside to this method is that it takes a while to get the most product out as possible. Not to mention you have to be very vigilant in changing the ice packs every 3-4 to four hours to keep your product condensing. A day later, I collect a little over 400 milliliters of isopropyl bromide. But to know how pure it is, I need the density. And the total density is... One hundred thirty point six grams. This number is well within the margin of error as just a few more drops can send it over. Not to mention the document density is three decimals, so this number can be easily rounded up. My total yield is around 550 grams of isopropyl bromide. This is approximately 4.47 moles of isopropyl bromide, which translates to roughly a 74% yield. I think that is pretty decent, but I feel like I could have gotten a better conversion if I used more sulfuric acid and or a larger excess of sodium bromide. Oh well, I'll redo this experiment soon with some tweaks and let you know in a community post. Just don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss it.